time once again for Community Forum, and we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Jen Marlowe and Nada Alawadi. Jen Marlowe is an author, documentary filmmaker, playwright, and human rights social justice activist. She is co-author of the books I Am Troy Davis and The Hour of Sunlight and author of Darfur Diaries, which is also the title of a documentary film she produced of the same name. She is director and producer of the new documentary Witness Bahrain, which premiered this week at the Seattle Transmedia Independent Film, film Festival, which we'll be talking about. Nada Alwadi is a Bahraini journalist who was a reporter for Al Wasat, Bahrain's most popular daily newspaper, where she covered the pro-democracy uprising in that country. She is also co-founder of the Bahraini Press Association, which seeks to protect Bahraini journalists from repression, and she is also co-producer of the documentary Witness Bahrain. Jen and Nada, thank you very much for both coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thanks Mike. So start out, Nada, if you would give us um, some history about the pro-democracy movement that from, uh, I think, most Americans perceive that it started in, in 2011. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Uh, sure. Uh, actually, um, the demand for <clears throat> Sorry, the demand for democracy in Bahrain didn't start in 2011. It's kind of a historic um, a demand since uh, our independence uh, in 1971 from uh, the British colony. Um, um, every 10 years, we will hear uh, all these popular uprisings or demands or protests by uh, uh, the population demanding that uh, I mean, more role of the of the population in, in terms of governing the country. Uh, you know, Bahrain is kind of an absolute monarchy uh, where uh, one family literally owns and controls all everything. And, uh, and that system um, have always felt uh, outdated for uh, the population. This is why um, the demands for democracy dates back even to the 20s or the 50s. There were uh, popular uprisings back then uh, for Bahrainis to demand uh, share in, 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 you know, in, in, the, in the political uh, uh, decision making process. Um, in, in 2002, uh, the new king came into power um, uh, promising a new reform. Um, with uh, new legislations, um, uh, we we for for the first time we actually had a parliament where uh, there were members in the parliament. People actually can vote for their, these members. After ten years of practicing uh, on that that new system, I'm talking about 2010. Everybody was. Uh, it was very clear that this uh, practice was not actually working, even though we had all these legislations and the uh, bodies, uh, bar parliament body, they uh, they can't really, I mean, people can't really make any decision within that particular system. The authorities are still in the hands of the king who can uh, resol dissolve the parliament any time. Um, Besides many other issues, obvi obviously uh, discrimination and and uh, uh, the the share of power and um, and uh, the rule of law, I would say that what there all all these issues somehow led to what happened in 2011. Uh, I'm sure many of your um, audience know or, or remember the popular uh, Arab. Uh, Arab Spring uprisings, which happened in 2011, uh, swept through the whole uh, Middle East. Even though I don't like like that term, Arab Spring, but anyways, we don't have any other terminology yet on for that. But uh, anyways, Bahrain was part of that. Um, it was so inspiring to see all, all these uh, 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 young people in in Egypt, for example, in Tahrir Square, uh, protesting and demanding change and democracy. That was so inspiring. Um, uh, to so many people and I was actually in Bahrain and I remember vividly um, people being glued to TV watching um, Egypt and actually going out and protesting to support the Egyptian people. Uh, so it was not surprising actually to see a um, few weeks later uh, that people organized themselves and, and said, you know what, we are going to do an Egyptian um, uh, style uh, revolution where they decided to uh, protest in the middle of uh, the capital Manama uh, in a place called uh, the Pearl Roundabout, which it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, a month later, there was a major crackdown on the, those protesters. Um, the, Pearl, uh, the Pearl Monument uh, was demolished. Um, um, and then, I mean, since then, actually, it was in, in April 2011 until now, uh, the country has been an, in a major uh, political crisis. Um, 
opposition le- leaders have been in jail since then. Uh, so many um, uh, Bahrainis have been uh, tortured, um, jailed, um, uh, oppressed upon, uh, fired from their jobs. Many of them had to leave their countries, their country uh, because of this crisis. And uh, unfortunately, until now, we don't see any solution, political solution in the horizon. In fact, you had to leave your country. Can you talk briefly about that? Sure, uh, that's actually very true. So I am a journalist. I worked for Al Wasat newspaper, which is uh, one of the most popular newspapers in Bahrain. And I also was a correspondent for USA Today in Bahrain, covering the story from the ground. And uh, when the crackdown started, they started targeting everybody who kind of took part in that movement. Uh, including doctors, professors, st- students, and obviously at the top of the list are journalists. So I was personally detained and, um, well, was told not to report. Uh, I was actually forced to sign a pledge not to report or uh, engage in any political affair. And uh, I really didn't feel safe afterwards. Um, it was very hard to do anything, uh, to do my job, basically, which is journalism. I'm not an, an activist or a, an opposition figure. I am I'm just a journalist who was trying to do my job, uh, interviewing people and telling their story. So um, so I decided to leave. I have been here in, in the States. I'm based in D.C. for the past uh, four years. And um, I was hoping that things will get better and um, and I will go back. But things were actually getting worse. And I'm not an exception. I, I mean, there are so many of my colleagues, uh, journalists who actually had to leave the country for similar reasons. Um, so, yeah, I mean, freedom of expression is kind of a myth now in Bahrain. It doesn't really exist because uh, local journalists have been targeted in almost every single way. And international journalists are not given uh, permissions to enter um, or visas to enter the country to report from the ground. So basically, there is a media blackout. The story doesn't really get covered. So people don't really know that this is still going on. Um, I mean, I I can still say that there are so many people who keep telling me, oh, is this still going on? I mean, we we thought that this is over by now, uh, Bahrain, but it is uh, pretty much... uh, still going on and I think Jin's uh, film shows or portrays a lot of it and shows that this pretty much is alive Uh, the struggle for these people is uh, still alive and Jen how did you get involved in this issue Uh, I got involved in Bahrain uh, in early 2012 there was a a group of colleagues uh, friends of mine who were putting together a team to enter Bahrain for the one year anniversary of the uprising. So the uprising, um, like Nada said, it had a long history, but uh, it, February um, February 14th, 2011 was when the, the large protests first started. At the one year anniversary of that, activists in Bahrain wanted to organize big demonstrations. They actually were hoping to retake the, the place where Pearl Roundabout once stood, which had since been demolished by the regime since it had become a symbol of the revolution. And so friends of mine who were some among the founders of the International Solidarity Movement in Palestine um, and who were I knew some of the Bahraini activists started really um, brainstorming with the Bahraini activists about putting together a, a, a team of international solidarity activists who would go in ahead of those demonstrations and be able to both um, to both witness what happened and also perhaps be a be a protective element because the expectation was that that these marches could lead in a real bloodbath and if there were internationals there that might um, and the regime knew that 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 might uh, that might encourage them to to use a little less force and so i was actually invited to be a part of that initial team i wasn't able to go at that time because i was in the midst of writing the manuscript for i am troy davis um which was i think the last time i was uh, speaking with you here in the studio when that book came out um but from that moment on i started playing very close attention to what uh, very close attention to what was happening to bahrain and i was already paying close attention to um the so-called arab spring and i knew i wanted to be able to find some way to express support and solidarity to to activists in the Middle East who were um, struggling for their basic human rights and and for their freedom. And so um, that group of activists went uh, went in, they all got into the country and they all got deported within, most of them within days. Um, I think one of them managed to hang on for a week before um, before she was deported, but they were most of them caught and deported within three or four days. 
But then a few months later, when I finished the first draft of the manuscript um, of my book that I was working on, and I had um, I had a little bit of time at that point, I reached out uh, um, to the activists in Bahrain and said, you know, is this still helpful to you to have international presence? And they said, yeah, definitely. Why don't you come? So I ended up going in June 2012, several months after that first group, but under the same premises as a solidarity activist to witness to um, and I'm really glad that I ended up going not with that initial group because I was able to, I was planning to stay for three weeks. I was deported at the end, but um, but after I had stayed the full three weeks, I was deported when I was leaving. They caught me at passport control, so I was able to stay for the whole time. Um, I didn't intend to make a film. That was not my intention in going. That just... <laughs> that just kind of happened while I was there. One of the activists gave me knew I was a filmmaker and gave me a camera. And I, I thought I'd be writing some blog posts about what I witnessed. I thought, okay, maybe I'll film some short interviews and do some, put some things up on YouTube. But you know, after several days of being there, I realized that there were there were really powerful stories that deserved more more attention than um, than just a, a clip on YouTube and and sort of in the middle of it all of a sudden I realized I was making a film without ever having planned to do that. There are several people in your film that uh, are the focus, one of, of whom we won't mention by name, but um, can you talk about, uh, let's talk about the, the woman that features mm -hmm. primarily in the film. So the woman who is primarily featured in the film, um, she, a phenomenal woman, she had been an investment banker and a pro-government supporter. And when she really, um, in 2011, when she really witnessed the bloodshed that the Bahraini regime, um, and she witnessed the crackdown uh, that the Bahraini regime was perpetrating, she did a, a 180. I mean, she hadn't wanted to believe that that was happening. She hadn't wanted to see it, but she went to the Pearl Roundabout saw with her own eyes and and that pushed her into doing human rights work she had never been an activist before she had never considered herself um to have anything to do with the field of human rights but she saw with her own eyes what was happening to her people and she felt that she couldn't stay silent so she contacted the bahrain center for human rights and she said i want to help however i can by the time i met her she was a fully committed activist and she was um, spending all her time trying to do a lot of what she was doing was the documentation of the stories of the doctors who had been detained and tortured. That story, of course, is, is in the film. Doctors who had been detained and tortured because they had treated injured protesters um, at the Pearl Roundabout. Uh, and at the hospital and at the main hospital, Salmani Hospital. So that had been one of her areas of deepest involvement. Um, but when I met her, I actually ended up staying uh, in her home for most of the time that I was in Bahrain. And, um, and we ended up traveling around the country together. And that that in many ways, um, became the film, it was following this young woman, as she was taking me around and as she was, um, you know, she was the one conducting the interviews, she was the one doing all the speaking with people. And I was just basically standing behind her with the camera and, and she's an extraordinary courageous uh, human being. And Bahrain of similar to the US but uh, a bit more active uh, uses surveillance heavily electronic surveillance so that um, it came out in the film that she couldn't really meaningfully ask specific information over the phone knowing that uh, that would be listened to and tracked. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. the The surveillance is um, the surveillance is really acute in Bahrain, and none of the Bahraini activists would use their cell phones um, for sensitive information. Um, there were there was very very creative ways that people had of trying to get each other information, and and um, everybody would use other you know harder to monitor harder to harder to crack uh, forms of communication but it, everyone knew that their cell phones were were being tapped and listened mm -hmm. to and and monitored and um mm -hmm. and yeah people were people were always very aware very aware of what to say so for example when the the young woman that we were talking about would be talking about me to another activist, if they, if they had to make a phone call, she would never say, um, oh, what time do you want to meet Jen? She would say, oh, that the that young woman who was at your house yesterday, what time do you want to meet her? And for her, it was just second nature to know what to say and what not to say so that things would be detected or not detected. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the activists on the ground were, were experts at how to, how to navigate uh, the surveillance systems in order to still communicate the way they needed to. 
Uh, actually, in uh, 2013, uh, Reporters Without Borders added uh, Bahrain as one of the top uh, 10 countries uh, that they called it uh, enemies of the internet, which is basically for mainly for the surveillance that you mentioned now, uh, which is actually quite interesting. There were uh, several um, uh, initiatives who um, uh, studied that in, in particular, that particular aspect of um, uh, monitoring and how, how the system of monitoring um, activists uh, uh, one of them is actually called uh, Bahrain Watch. Uh, the, this is a group of international activists who are uh, quite savvy in terms of technology. And they actually analyzed many of the links that have been sent uh, by, via email to several activists, Bahraini activists, and uh, proved scientifically that these um, these links contain uh, malware. Uh, many of these activists, uh, uh, by just clicking on that particular link, uh, and, uh, there will be an inst installation of a malware in their devices and they will be tracked. Everything in their uh, computers or devices will be tracked. Uh, there were also um, uh, several cases of IP hacking. Um, so they will actually also uh, send links um, around, uh, like to activists who are very uh, quite active in social media for the Twitter or Facebook. And just by clicking on that link, maybe by mistake, you install a device that they will know where you look, your location is. And in, in some cases, there were people who were um, in, in few hours after kind of clicking on that particular uh, link the police were at their door in their houses and they were arrested and, and jailed so um, and and actually um, it's it's interesting because that particular initiative found out that the software that the government is using is is done by um, a German company uh, gamma and they contacted them and uh, said that you are selling this uh, this uh, surveillance uh, software to governments to spy on activists and they denied it publicly but it was proven in several cases that this is actually the software i mean ma in many cases the software that is used by uh, governments in in around the world in the th in, in the middle east in particular um uh, is done by countries in the west and it's sold by by um uh, big companies to these governments to spy on their act uh, on their on their uh, uh citizens so yeah i mean I, I agree i mean it's kind of very hard everybody knows that you know now that we we have a political crisis that um, nothing is safe uh, online. If you tweet, if you um, share information, if you are uh, well known, you will be um, uh, monitored. In fact, tweets are uh, what got one of the people featured in your film, Jen, uh, thrown into prison. Can you talk about that? Correct, yeah. Um, Nabil Rajab is one of the activists that the film features, and Nabil is, um, I would call him, one of the most prominent human rights uh, defenders in Bahrain and, and actually in the Arab world. He's the um, co-founder and the president of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. And when I was in Bahrain, he had... Uh, when I when I first arrived in Bahrain, he was in prison um, because of of messages that he sent out on Twitter that the regime found insulting, and it's illegal in Bahrain, by the way, to insult the king, um, and 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 by association to insult the regime. So anything that they decide is insulting, which could be any tweet that indicates criticism, any tweet that indicates opposition. Um, that that is actually officially criminalized in Bahrain. Um, so Nabil was in prison when I arrived. He got out of prison shortly after I arrived in Bahrain. Um, and so I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with him and, and hear about his philosophy um, and his struggle for human rights, for democracy, and, and his support for, for Bahrainis rising up nonviolently um, to challenge the oppression and uh, that they were facing. And, and, and Nabil was, was very clear in his emphasis of, of support for nonviolent struggle and for peaceful struggle, which, which is really a hallmark of the, of the Bahraini revolution. And um, and while I was in Bahrain, we got notice that uh, there were still several cases pending against Nabil. And one of those cases, um, a verdict and a sentence had been handing down. And Nabil was sentenced to three months um, in prison, again, for another tweet that he sent out. Um, and so uh, when 
when I learned this, we uh, rushed right over to Nabil's house, knowing that the police would be coming sometime that morning to, to take him away to prison. And, and so I had the opportunity to conduct the final interview with him um, and then hit upstairs in his house filming as the police came and um, took him away and, and took him to prison. And that three-month sentence uh, ended up getting extended to two years because while he was in prison, um, the other charges that were against him, those sentences came in. So he ended up being in prison for two years um, all because of freedom, freedom of expression and you know, exercising what should be the international right of freedom of expression and freedom uh, for peaceable assembly. Um, he got out of prison just this past June um, and was then detained again in October, briefly for a few weeks, then was released and then was arrested again just last month on April 1st um, or April 2nd and uh, and right now remains in prison. Um, so... Uh, and again, it was because of, um, I believe, the official charge. I believe it was the cyber crime unit um, that arrested him. And the official charge was spreading false information mm-hmm. on Twitter. So Bahrain is a country where your tweets can land you two years in prison. Nabil faces a possibility of an up to 10 year prison sentence right now. Um, with the different charges that are leveled against him. And they're all charges that are based on him practicing his right to freedom of expression um, and freedom of peaceable assembly. And yet, um, truth in tweets didn't seem to affect, was it the government that sent out a tweet that uh, involved you? It, it was not. I, I, it was not officially the government, but there are a series of um, there are a series of trolls basically that are all aligned with the government, and it's very clear that they're you know that they that they are supported by what well, exact the details of exactly how the relationships between these trolls and the government works is a bit murky, but it's it's very clearly connected. And, and that's how we learned um, uh, that the government was fully aware that I was in Bahrain and fully aware of what I was doing is uh, they started sending out some tweets that, that involved me. And, um, and when we saw those tweets, um, uh, the, the woman who I was profiling, who we were traveling around together, um, uh, you know, she and I began to see those tweets and and realized that that you know my cover had been blown. They knew I was here, and at that point, we realized we might you know we might only have a matter of time. We never you know, we never knew at night you'd hear helicopters overhead, and you never knew if they were going to be who who whose house they were raiding. Was it going to be the house where I was staying? Um, was I able to get all my footage uploaded before they would come and raid that house to arrest me? Because, of course, I had sensitive interviews with people um, that I needed to get uploaded and out of the country. So every day we would go around filming and every night would be feeling like it was a race against the clock to get all the footage uploaded and then wiped off of, you know, off of the drive so that we weren't putting other people at risk. So just, uh, just over five minutes left. So talk about the uprising how it is a non-violent mm-hmm. uprising my impression is is that women play a significant if not the leading part in mm-hmm. the uprising mm-hmm. and then if you could also talk about the u.s role in all of this in five minutes yes uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's hard first. but we will try um yeah i mean uh, generally speaking the uh, this particular uprising what happened in bahrain were was uh, seen by everybody actually generally as a non-violent uh, uprising people um uh, were basically organizing themselves uh, uh bringing new tactics basically to raise their messages uh, by just being uh, very peaceful using the 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 methods that i mean many of the uh, 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 protesters in many of the uh, arab countries actually used and uh, the presence of women uh, the presence of old men uh, in these uh, protests the kids uh, shows that um, um, it's uh, not an, um, uh, uh, surprising to see these uh, uh, images of uh, popular protests, um, huge line of, of protesters, actually at some point hundreds of thousands of people protesting. And, and by the way, we are talking ab- about a tiny country. When you see hundreds of thousands of people outside demanding something, just marching, uh, that's actually quite powerful. In fact, many people know that this was actually the most popular uprising among the in the Arab countries. Uh, in fact, the majority of the population at many points went outside to, d- to demand this this change. If it was a fraction of the population in Egypt or 
or Syria or other countries, uh, it was actually the majority of the population. And uh, and these there were so many uh, powerful images of uh, of active activists uh, practicing peaceful um, uh, uh, peaceful and nonviolent um, uh, tactics basically on the ground. I remember now um, uh, powerful images of a, a, a human rights activist. Uh, her name is Zainab Al Khwaja. She was at some point um, just uh, sitting in. Uh, uh, a location in, in 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 northern Bahrain, and um, she was forced. She was actually dragged uh, by the police uh, to remove her from her location, and she was standing on that particular location just peacefully. And the images were so powerful; they went viral. Obviously, they pop. They were published by all the media, and it shows because you know she's a woman and she's just sitting there, and she is basically being dragged by the government and or by the police uh, officer. Uh, uh, and uh, the power, the power of these images shows how much you know people are really um, uh, determined to uh, raise their voices, even though with uh, with all this repression. Uh, unfortunately, even though um, I, we we know and believe that the sta- the uh, United States, for example, as an ally to uh, Bahrain, knows that for a fact. Uh, knows that this is a popular uh, uprising and it is it represents the majority of the population and it is a peaceful um, uh, movement. Uh, unfortunately, the role was not as supportive as uh, we have expected as Bahrainis. Um, we always look at the United States as as a country that is uh, the values of democracy and human rights is in the heart of this particular nation and um, and and the experience for this nation uh, to rise as a as a as an international power is basically um, as it's rooted in these values and which is why when we see their um, their uh, reaction towards what what is happening in our country we we are actually um, um, uh, disappointed actually actually with with all the uh, with all the statements that okay always uh, mentions that Bahrain the Bahraini government is an ally to the United States yeah. but there are human rights uh, violations that have been committed here and there but then again there are no actual actions to support the change to support the people and uh, their demands uh, we do understand i mean it's it's kind of um, very uh, uh, um, clear that you know, but uh, the U.S. Fifth Fleet Navy is stationed in Bahrain. This is a major, uh, major um, factor that plays a part in why the U.S. is not actually supporting any change. We do realize and um, that Saudi Arabia, which is our neighbor, which made it very clear that Bahrain is their territory, um, um, is as a very important ally to the United States. And this is why it will be very hard to support uh, a, a, a democratic Bahrain in this environment. But again, we I think uh, the Bahraini citizens are looking for the United States to stand by their values, the values that they have always uh, uh, tried to share and support around the world. And I, we didn't see that in Bahrain. Jenny, you want to add something? Well, I, I wanted to make sure the point about the U.S. Navy Fifth Fleet being based in Bahrain got mentioned, and, and then and then you mentioned that. Um, but I would say that we, as U.S. citizens, also have have a role here. I mean, our our government is set up, at least in theory, that we're able to um, we're able to let our concerns known to our representatives and the U.S. government, um, who does back up the regime of Bahrain. We can let our representatives know that we we expect um, our government to hold the Bahraini government accountable for their human rights violations and to implement true reforms. I suggest for folks who want more information, they should definitely go to the film's website, which is witnessbahrain.com. If folks want to take action on behalf of Nabil Rajab, um, they can go to bahrainrights.org. There is currently a petition right now that the Bahrain Center for Human Rights is circulating to try to press for Nabil's release. Um, and I think there's there's lots of ways that we in this country are responsible for what's happening in Bahrain. Um, so therefore, a lot of responsibility on us as citizens to make our voices heard about this. All right. And uh, are there going to be any other showings of Witness Bahrain? Uh, the next showing that's going to be in Seattle is going to be, um, and, and I don't have the details of this quite yet, but it's going to be at Seattle's Arab Fest at the end of August. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you both for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Thanks at all.